So once you've got your statement, in terms of induction, there's, well, in terms of what I look for when I'm making sure you're doing induction correctly, I actually look for four pieces in your work. The first thing that I look for is your basis step. And remember, your basis step is where you plug in the smallest integer that's supposed to work for the statement. And then you, after you plug in that integer, you say, oh, yeah, it works. The equality is true. Or, no, it doesn't work. Or if it's an inequality, you check the inequality. Yeah. So this one here is like checking an example. Second thing that you want to do is what we've been calling our hypothesis statement. Other people call it the assumption step. I have to admit, I often personally call it the assumption step, which is why you've probably been hearing both the word hypothesis and assumption from me. Both of these two guys, really, really straightforward. Even with your eyes closed and no idea what to do at all, hopefully you should be able to do, get the first two steps. And actually the last step, which is the conclusion too. But that one takes a little bit more thought. The main thing of the entire method is the induction step. It's where we get our name for mathematical induction. What it does is you use this hypothesis, you use this assumption, and then we're going to show that the statement is true for the next integer bigger than whatever k was, and k was a semi-randomly picked integer. Now, when I say semi-randomly picked, that's not the right word. It's called a um, arbitrary integer. The arbitrary doesn't mean you get to pick any number you want. It means you put in the symbol K, and K represents if you had picked any number you want. It's like, this is not a technical term, but it's like a generic stand-in for a picked example. Okay. And then this one here in the induction step would say, for whatever guy you had, somebody else had shown previously, your K, if that worked, the next one has to work. And then your conclusion says, hey, all right, well, if your basis step worked and your induction step worked, well, that means that if you actually logically push this to its conclusion, the statement really has to work for all your integers that you care about. Okay? So that was the snapshot or the recap of induction. Let us now actually get to an example. So last time we had, what was it, three examples. We had one example with factoring. We had one example with adding up terms in a sequence. And we had one example dealing with sets. So let us jump into this next example. Now for this next example, I don't have anything written other than the actual example at the top of the page. But for this next example, what we want to do is we want to prove that, or we want to use induction to prove that 1 plus 2 to the n is less than 3 to the n for n is greater than some smallest n value. Now this is something that you can see sometimes in induction questions. You've got some guess for, in, in this case, inequality, or equation that you think is a true fact, but you haven't actually found the smallest integer where it works yet, so then you have to go back and find that. Now I'm going to throw this question to you guys. What do you guys think the smallest n would be where this would work? I'm actually going to put this into, let me go share this so you can see it, um, put this into one of our Pool Everywhere questions. So think about this for a sec, see what you think. This ex And while you're doing that, I'll jabber a little bit so it's not total dead air here. Um, if you guys recall this particular inequality, we've had one really similar to it before, when the inequality was flipped. So when it was 1 plus 2 to the n is greater than or equal to 3 to the n, we actually found a counterexample of it. So that was a little while back. So this is now taking that same, trying to relate the 1 plus a power of 2 to a power of 3, but now we flip the inequality and we are hoping that this way it actually works. Okay. Typically when you're trying to find um, your smallest n, it can technically be negative numbers, but typically you're you start looking when n equals zero and then walk up bigger integers until you get to some smallest n that actually works. And watch out, the key thing here is all of the integers larger than that smallest integer have to work. Every so often you get weird cases where um, it'll work just fine for say n equals zero, n equals one, it doesn't work, and n equals two and bigger it works again. In that case, the smallest n would be the 2. 
All right, it looks like most of you are getting guesses. Almost everybody has made a guess so far. So let us start figuring out what we would do in this sort of situation. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this second one so the screen is bigger again. All right. So for this guy, if we are trying to find our basis step, We'll go ahead and start at, oh, let us not do red if I'm going to have to do the whole screen in red. All right. So what did you guys think? N equals zero. Did it work? I got one vote for now. This would be 1 plus 2 to the 0, which is 1 plus 1, which is 2. And if you looked at 3 to the n, that would be 3 to the 0 or 1. And nope, that inequality does not work in that direction. The um, inequality is actually flipped in that case. Now, if we looked at n equals 1, does the inequality work for n equals 1? What did you guys get? So assuming I didn't make any calculation errors there, I got three on both sides of the inequality. So what does that tell us? Does it work for n equals one? Yeah, no, because the inequality doesn't include an equal symbol. So that also doesn't work. So here's hoping n equals two works. So if we plug in n equals two, we'll have one plus two to the n. So that's one plus two squared. What is that, five? And then we have 3 to the n, or 3 squared, which is 9. So quick check. Do those numbers, the 5 and the 9, satisfy the inequality with the inequality in the correct direction? In other words, did we just find a basis step? Yeah, so this one actually works. So this is also our basis step. So we can say, hey. And teeny tiny letters because it didn't leave enough space. Basis step. Notice what we did along the way there. Not only did we figure out what the smallest value of n is, we also went ahead and when we found it, we did our basis step. And all the ones that didn't work, we actually had some examples to show us what we were actually thinking about doing. Now, once you've established your basis step, what was the next thing we needed to do? Anybody remember? So that's like step one. You guys tell me, what's step two? Yep, so next, step two is to do our hypothesis step. So I always like to label this in part. That is because I am often writing it for you guys. But it's also, it just helps anybody who is reading it besides yourself keep track of what you're doing. Now, remember, actually, it helps yourself keep track of what you're doing, too. Remember, hypothesis step literally takes whatever you were given and changes up the ends and replaces the ends with k's. And that's it. Don't overthink the hypothesis step. The only thing that can be added to the hypothesis step that isn't just rewriting what you're given is once you've rewritten what you're given, maybe you want to, oh, I don't know, in this case, subtract one from the other side. Why you would want to do that, I don't know, but you could. Okay. So here, we'll just say that we assume. You always put in the word assume, because this is our mathematical way of saying we are, well, assuming that this works for n equals k. And that's any k that we want as long as that k is at least the basis step or bigger in terms of the end value. Now, that takes care of step two. What's step three? So what do you guys think? What's step three? Actually, I should probably number these. 
One, two. And we'll go ahead and put step three over here so we have more space for it. So what do you guys think? What should step three? Not asking you to write it out because step three is longer. But what do you think we should do for step three? Or maybe another way of phrasing it. If you guys were working this problem on your own, what would you do next? Yep. So the next thing is the induction step or when we try to see what's going on when n equals k plus 1. So I'm going to go ahead and write here n equals k plus 1 to the side. Technically speaking, you do not do not need these little n equals in the boxes to the side. All of your words or work should include enough information for somebody to know that. But even though that's true, I still put these guys to the side when I'm writing it out because I feel like it really helps you keep track of what you're doing. Now, if you don't do that, that's totally fine. But I would highly recommend, at least for one of the times you work induction on your own, go ahead and put these little notes in there to yourself. See if it helps. Okay. So let me label this one. This is our induction step. Now, the key thing with the induction step is you're trying to show that the statement when n equals k plus 1 is true. So let us actually go and to the side over here, write out what we're going to need. So for our statement when n equals k plus 1, and again, this in red is scratch work. It's not something that you'd actually write in your proof. It's only for us to know where we're going to start and end. Well, what do we need? We need our inequality. So here's our inequality right up here. We need our inequality to work if n equals k plus 1. So we'll simply have 1 plus 2 to the k plus 1 is less than or equal to 3 raised to the k plus 1. Now, it does not matter which side of this inequality you start on and which side you end on. So, um, actually, when I prepped this one out ahead of time, I actually started with the side that's the 3 raised to an exponent. You totally could start with a side that has the 1 plus 2 raised to the exponent as well. It doesn't matter. Um, one of the reasons that I started with the larger side is inequalities have a tendency to mess with people's heads. And it's not because there's anything fundamentally different, weird, or crazy about them. It's simply that in an inequality, if you start with one side, to get to the other side, you either have to add stuff or subtract stuff. So like if we started here with the 1 plus 2 raised to some power, as we go along our work, we'd have to add something to get up to the power of 3. And most people find it easier to remove something that's already there that's unwanted as opposed to put in something new that's not visible. Okay? So most people do find it easier to start from the larger side and drop down to the smaller side. That being said, it, it does not matter. Um, Half the time I do this example in class, I start with a side that has the powers of 2, half the time with the powers of 3. So let me go back to blue writing. So in, this, so in our case, let's start here, and let's go ahead and end here, which means we then go ahead and we consider 3 raised to the k plus 1, and then we'll do some work. Now, what do we know about 3 raised to the k plus 1? We're going to do the same trick that we did yesterday with an exponent. Notice this exponent is added, and what did we say or remind ourselves yesterday as an algebraic property? If you have a sum up in the exponent, it can be written as a product. So in this particular case, Anybody have a guess on how we could break up that 3 raised to a k plus 1 into a product or two things multiplied together? So while you guys are thinking about how to break up that power of 3 into two things multiplied together, here's why you would think about that. Remember, you always want to use the hypothesis step 
Yep, there's the answer. You always want to use the hypothesis step somewhere in your induction step. And notice your hypothesis step right here. Actually, let me do a different color to highlight. Oh, what color? We've been using red. Right here has just the 3 to the K. So in the induction step, we want to get rid of the exponent k plus 1 and somehow rewrite or get down to what? Get down to our 3 raised to the k. Why? That way we can actually do the same plug-in that we've done in the past. Now, when we plug in stuff, it will be a little bit different than when we've done this in the past. All of our other examples so far with induction have dealt with equations, so equal sign. We don't have an equal sign anymore. Here we have, oh, my cursor left. Oh, there it is. Here we have an inequality symbol, which means when we replace the 3 to the k with 3, that part didn't change, with the 1 plus 2 to the k, notice right there I just replaced, just replaced the 3 to the k with the 1 plus 2 to the k. That's it. But are we going to have an equals out front? In other words, what symbol should we put right here? Hint, it's not the equal symbol. It's going to be an inequality, and it's going to be an inequality because of this inequality over here. So what do you guys think? Should I put a less than symbol or a greater than symbol? In other words, is this new expression smaller or bigger than the previous line? I'm trying to rephrase so it's easier for you guys to type in answers or send in answers. Ooh, we have one vote. What do you guys think? Is he right? We have two votes. Now, the way that I phrased the question was, okay, there's another vote. So we have votes on both sides. So the way that I'm reading this question is you're going from line two, so the three times three to the K, dropping to line three, so reading down like you normally would reading top to bottom on the page. So going from that line two down to line three, are we getting bigger or smaller when we go from line two to line three? And one of the two answers that's been given in is correct. So what do you guys think? Which one of those answers is correct? Notice the only thing that changed was the 3 to the k and the 1 plus 2 to the k. And what's the relationship between those guys? pausing because I'm just hoping for more votes because we're close to tied right now. But I'm not seeing any more coming. All right. So it turns out it actually gets smaller. Now, why does it get smaller? It's all about reading your inequality in the correct direction. So if you come over here, your 3 to the k is the larger of the two. So when we start off and we replace the larger of the two with the smaller of the two, that means the entire product is going to drop, so the entire product is going to get smaller. Now, that's not unexpected. That's even what we want. Why? Because we want the 3 raised to the k plus 1 to do what? We want it to reduce in size. We want to get it smaller so that we can still get this 1 plus 2 raised to the exponent. Okay. So now that we're at this stage, I'm just going to manipulate this a little bit. Specifically, let's distribute the 3 through on both terms. So this is the same as 3 plus 3 times 2 to the k. Okay. That was a proper equals because we did exactly normal algebra. We didn't leave off anything or change anything. Now, compare and contrast. This is the expression we currently have. That's the expression we need. Notice we need two terms. We've got two terms. One of the terms needs to be an integer, a 1. One of the terms is an integer, but not a 1. Second term needs to be a 2 raised to the k plus 1. 
second term is a 2 raised to the k, but instead of multiplied, being multiplied by that extra factor of 2, it's multiplied by an extra factor of 3. So let us go ahead and rewrite in our next step. And I am going to claim that this next step is, see if you believe this, I'm going to replace the 3 with a 1. Click check. Is replacing that first term, replacing the 3 in the first term with a 1, does that make us get to be a smaller number? Just looking at this first term. In other words, is that inequality correct just looking at this first term? Those two bits. Hopefully in your heads, you're all thinking, yes. Huh? So then, second thing to do is, what is our goal? Our goal is to get to 1 plus. Well, that's why I picked the 1, 1 being smaller than 3. Yeah, we're good to go. But the second term is supposed to be 2 raised to some power. Well, I don't have only 2s up here. I have this 3. So I'm going to switch out the 3 with a 2. Here's the check. We want to make sure that our inequality is still correct. So if we look at that inequality, and let me get a different color for the highlighter if possible. I don't think it's possible. Oh, maybe it is. Replace that 3 with this 2. Is that 2 actually still smaller? Is the 2 smaller than the 3? And hopefully you're all thinking in your heads, yes, which means, yes, this inequality right here is accurate. Because in both of the two, two terms, we'll replace something we had with something we was smaller. Now, for both of them, we chose the things we chose by looking ahead to what it was that we actually cared about. Okay? So up here, the first equals was just algebra. The second line, or between the second and third line, was using our hypothesis step, or our hypothesis. but And then we just had some algebra again. But this one here was really, we had to look ahead to see what we were getting to. Now, let's go ahead and put this in the correct format, equals 1 plus. And if we go ahead and combine the 2 times 2 to the k, this is our 2 raised to the k plus 1. And that is exactly what we were hoping to get in our induction step. Makes sense what we did. What are you, questions? All right. Well, in that case, once you get that everything worked for the induction step, once you got that everything worked for your basis step, the only thing left is the conclusion, and the conclusion is simply, Thus, using induction, this inequality 1 plus 2 to the n is less than 3 to the n for all. Actually, I don't need both a 4 as well as the for all symbol, but we're just going to go for it, is greater than or equal to 2. And the assumption here, although I didn't explicitly say it, is n has to be an integer. Huh? So that would be your conclusion. Questions? Make sense? Kind of okay-ish so far. On this particular example, you could have done this exact same thing, but starting with the um, 1 plus 2 raised to the k plus 1, you would have just done that same work, but starting bottom and going up to the top to get to the 3 raised to the k plus 1. But it's a little bit more difficult to deal with that step right there when you are going from the powers of 2 into the factors of 3 up there. Eh, you still do it just fine. It just, it's sometimes harder to see. All right, I am not seeing any questions come in from you guys, so let us go to the next example. So the next example that I've got for us goes back to one that everything is written out in words. So this one is I went ahead and put this one together in two parts. And the first part is just to write out and try to build the formula that we're going to care about. That's what we'll do on 
uh, this page. And then the next one is we'll go and actually do the induction once we have the formula we need. Okay. So this one here says use induction to show that the sum of the first n positive odd integers is n squared. Note we've dealt with this before. Now we just want to go ahead and put it together in the symbols. Okay. So if we're looking at here are the key things that we are looking at, we're looking at a sum. Don't forget the sum. And we're looking at the first n, so we're looking at n, positive odd integers, okay? Now, technically speaking, you could actually start at n equals zero. The first zero odd integers, well, there's none of them, so you say zero. And that sum of nothing is zero, and zero squared is still zero. I'm not going to be that crazy. We're just going to start at one, because that's naturally where we start thinking about counting things. So if we have here n equals 1, you've got your first positive in, odd integer. n equals 2, you've got 1 plus 3, so the first two odd integers. n equals 3 is the first three odd integers. n equals 4 is the first four positive integers. And we've totally worked on this. Um, problem before. And what did we find when you guys worked on it before? That all of these guys turned out to be what? They all turned out to be the square numbers. Or if you write it in terms of the n squared, n squared, n squared, n squared, n squared, and so forth. Okay. So that wasn't the point here, besides reminding you that, yep, it had worked in the past. I think we had one of our activities was exactly this guy. Now, what we actually want to get to is we want to get down to the case where you have your arbitrary n. Okay, so this is n in general. So if we said n, would they have to say something like n equals n, which is true, but ridiculous, so I didn't write it down. So in general, what would we have? We would have 1 plus 3 plus 5, except I totally did a typo, ah, 7, 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus dot 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 plus something which we need to fill in is supposed to equal n squared. Please note one of the reasons why I did this ahead of time is to remind ourselves what needs to go in that very last block. And we have talked about that before. Anybody remember what we needed to do to grab that very last term? In other words, the nth. Uh, odd integer. Don't worry, I'll wait. Anybody remember? Almost. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, if you just add an N inside of that last um, set of parentheses, it's the same as what the example was we did last time, which is just adding up all of the integers instead of only adding an odd integer. So, sadly, slightly more complicated. So, if this guy here is the nth odd integer, there is a way to find it. Okay? One of them is just knowing how we normally write odd integers. And I mean, that would be something that I would guess, but I've also been working with these sequences for a while now. So if you're not sure what to do, and you know that you want that last term in the sum, here is a way to go about dealing with it. Let me highlight the last number that we're adding up. When n equals 1 is 1, when n equals 2 is 3, when n equals 3 is 5, when n equals 4 is 7, that's this guy right here. Now let's get back to something that we can actually write with. So oh, select – okay, that was weird. Oh, that's going to bother me. There we are. 
All right. So n equals 1, 1, n equals 2, 3, 5, 7, dot, dot, dot. Anybody notice a pattern of what's going on with those numbers? Ah, there's some guesses. Yes. So the pattern going on here is, ah, is these guys differ by two each time. So this is an arithmetic sequence. And if you grab an arithmetic sequence, what it would say is your starting number, the one, plus two, which is the difference each time, multiplied by, well, if you started it zero, you'd multiply by n, but you actually here multiply by n minus one because we started at n equals one, which is exactly what one of you guessed, which is two n minus one here. Two n minus one is one of the common ways to actually write an odd number. So let's double check and make sure that actually is giving us the right integers each time. So if you plug in n equals one here, Yep, 2 minus 1, that's 1. Plug in n equals 2 here. That would be 4 minus 1 is 3. Yep, we're good. Okay. So this here now is the formula that we are going to be looking at. Okay. Notice we had almost everything. The only thing we really needed to calculate for sure to get it into a proper format was this last term right here, which was either you do a couple guesses and checks, if you know anything about odd numbers, if they're normally 2n plus or minus 1, you just have to check two things. Or you actually build the arithmetic sequence and figure out what that formal formula is from the arithmetic sequence. Okay? Both ways work. Now, once we have this formula, now we're ready to actually use the induction. Because we can't do the induction until we have this formula. So I'm about to go to a second slide. Do you guys have everything written down that you want written down? All right, I'm going to assume that is yes because nobody yelled no. So going to the second slide, went ahead and have the formula written down at the very top. Now, at this level, in a homework question, I might give you something like what you saw on the last uh, slide that has what? That has you need to actually build this equation. But realistically, I would often just give you this question as an induction question as it's currently written. And the reason we did the first step there was one, to show you what you might need to do at some point in your life. But two, often when you see these dot, dot, dots, or often when people see these dot, dot, dots, they forget to look at the part ahead of time. And it's so frequently that I get people trying to show that 2n minus 1 equals n squared. And then they get the conclusion that that doesn't work, which is accurate, but it's not the question they were asked. Uh, so I wanted to make sure, watch out for these dot, dot, dots, these ellipses right here. This means we're actually adding up those first n odd integers. Uh, so first thing you'd want to do is the basis step. Now for the basis step, what is the basis step? In other words, what's the n value for our basis step? What value of n? for our basis step. Yeah, so this one here totally is when n equals one. So then what do we do with our basis step? We'll look at the two sides and I'll go ahead and grab our left-hand side and our right-hand side. And since it's typed up here so beautifully, we'll go ahead and just title it so, it's, so we remember left-hand side, right-hand side. So if we plug one into the left-hand side, well, we're adding up the first positive integer, which we've done in the past on the last slide, which is just one. And if we plug, uh, you can also have this formula if n here is zero, yes. You don't re, you wanna make sure you still have this first part added in, so don't just have the last part. But yeah, it, the formula also works for zero. If you plug in zero here, this side would be zero odd integers, and it would just be zero, and plug in zero here, it would be zero squared. So it would also work there. I'm gonna start at one, just so we don't have the case where there's the nothing on the left-hand side. But yeah, it, the formula actually does work for n equals zero as well. Um, so then if we plug in for the right-hand side, we'll have the 
1 squared or 1, and notice this is exactly the first case that we looked at on the last slide. So we actually already did our basis step when we were trying to figure out what the last term was in this sum. Now, after you have your basis step, you're then ready for your hypothesis step. So don't overthink it. Your hypothesis step is exactly what you have written up here, except what changes? The n changes to a k, and that is literally it. So to put the little tag line at the beginning, this is when n equals k. Now, next step is your induction step. And for your induction step, what are we going to do? Well, we probably want to know what we're looking for for our induction step. So let me go ahead and actually put our same little thing that we've done in all of our other cases, which is look at our statement when n equals k plus 1. Okay. So in our induction step, we want to show that the statement works when n equals k plus 1. So what should it look like? In other words, what should our starting point and our ending point look like? Well, we'd be adding up the first k plus 1 terms, so odd numbers, so 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus dot, 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 plus, well, we've got 2k minus 1, but that would be the kth term. Anybody have a guess on what this k plus first term is? And I'll do the easy part. All of that's supposed to be k plus 1 squared, which is just replacing the n with a k plus 1. So what do you guys think we should write in this missing block right there? This is super key. We can't get to the rest of the question if we don't have that last term. Don't worry, I will wait for you guys to send in answers. So how would we get it? How would we get that new last term? So this is now the trying to point Oh, there it is, it's super duper tiny. This last term over here that may be difficult to see. Highlighted in yellow in the missing block over there in the red block. What is that guy? That is the k plus first odd number or odd integer. So how would we get it? Anybody have a guess? It's okay if your guess is wrong. Key here is that you're guessing. All right, so the nth or k plus first term here is 2, 2k plus 1. That 2k plus 1 came from where? It came from grabbing this formula right here, the 2n minus 1, grabbing the n, and replacing that n with a k plus 1. Now here's a key thing to watch out for is make sure you put parentheses around this thing. Distribute the 2, so you get the 2k plus 2, then subtract the 1, and you'll get that 2k plus 1. Now, once you have that in play, we're ready to go ahead and start trying to do the induction step. So remember what's going on with the induction step. This is where we're dealing with that n equals k plus 1 situation, which is why we had all the scratch work in red over there to the side. And the very first thing that we need to do is we need to grab one of the two sides. Anytime you're adding up terms of a sequence, always grab that sum side first. It's almost impossible to do it the other direction, okay? Now, what do we know about this thing? Well, the first thing we know is it's got these ellipses and that's difficult to work with. So we look at it and we say, all right, well, is there anything that looks really familiar to us? Is there anything that we could replace in this sum with something that we know for sure? So what do you guys think? Is there anything here that looks really familiar? 
hint there should be. In other words, what have we always used in the induction step to push ourselves forward? We would love to use something that's already on the screen or board or slide or whatever I should properly call this thing. So which step should we look at to pull some information? What do you guys think? Yeah, we should totally look at the hypothesis step. Now, in the hypothesis step, there's an equals k squared. We don't have any of that stuff here. So look at the left-hand side. The left-hand side says we added 1 and 3 and 5 all the way up to k minus 1. Well, we have way more than that down here, but we do have the 1 through k minus 1, it's just plus more. So what will we do? We'll go ahead and say, hey, let me replace that sum that I currently have with the k squared from the hypothesis step. Okay. Now, why did I put in both of these last terms? You don't have to. You could have skipped out on this k minus 1 last term. I on purpose put in both of the last two terms, so this is the sum of the first k plus 1 odd integers. So this would be the kth odd integer, and this would be the k plus first odd integer. I did it on purpose just to deal with the hypothesis step. So anytime you're doing a sum, I would definitely recommend having not just the very, very last number expression, but also at least one or two previous numbers expression, just so that you can spot your hypothesis really easily. But again, that is to some extent personal preference. I find it much easier to spot this thing if that 2k minus 1 is right down here. But again, not everybody does it that way. Now, once we've replaced this sum with the k squared, there's only that last k plus first term. So we've got k squared plus 2k plus 1. Now remember what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to the k plus 1's quantity squared. So notice what we have right here. I mean, there's parentheses, so we could totally write this thing without parentheses. So k squared plus 2k plus 1. If we factor that expression of this k squared plus 2k plus 1, do we actually get k plus 1 whole quantity squared? What do you guys think? Do we get the thing we were trying to get? Yeah, so if you factor that guy, it does actually turn out to be k plus 1 quantity squared. That is exactly the thing that you wanted to get here. So this means that the induction step worked or it holds is a proper term. So if your basis step worked or holds and your induction step worked or holds, our conclusion is, yep, this particular mathematical sentence, if you will, this equation works whenever n is 1 or bigger. Technically, it also works when n equals 0, um, but we didn't address that situation today. Questions make sense, kind of feeling a little bit okay. And this one would have mimicked really, really closely that example that we had last time where we just added up the first n integers. Formula is different, but formatting of the induction is really similar. This is also a really, really common um, intro level induction question that you would see. Like if you looked up induction online, you'd see lots of examples that are similar to this or exactly the same as this one. It's a pretty common one to see. All right, I am not seeing any questions come in from you guys. So let us jump now and look at type two induction. And based on time, we'll probably have enough time to go over what type two or strong induction is and then look at probably one example. And almost all of the examples of strong induction that I have for us are, in fact, dealing with sequences. So with this first example, we'll go ahead and look at sequences, too. And I have it in a different file. So let me pull up that other file. Strong induction. All right, this looks like the right one. Let's get rid of that so you can see it easier. Get me with my correct drawing marker, and we are off to go. 
And stop sharing this one. All right, there we are. All right, so first thing was the recap in terms of the induction we've just been dealing with. So the induction we've just been dealing with is the weak induction. If you can see it just faintly, that really itty teeny weeny bitty cursor right there. So this is the one we've exactly been doing. You're given a statement, you check the first value for n to see if it works in the statement. You have your assumption step or your hypothesis step, and then using your hypothesis step, you show the induction step is true. Okay? That's regular old induction. Now, strong induction, otherwise known as type 2 induction, is almost identical, almost exactly the same. There's really only two changes. Okay? The first one is, well, the first thing is, again, you're going to be given some statements, so that part isn't different. The basis step, though, may change. So in your basis step, actually, let me get a different color so I can highlight this. Your basis step here, you may need to check the first several integers that you're supposed to, they're supposed to work in your given statement. And typically, it's at least two, it's typically between two and five of the first several values for n that you need to plug in and check. There is a way to tell how many values of n you need to use. And this depends on, so the number of n's to check is the same as, well, you have to check a value for n for every formula you have. And sometimes in strong induction, you have several formulas. So this would be number of formulas used or in play. Okay. Now, there's other ways to check it, too. But that's a really fast and easy way to figure out how many of the first several values of n's you look at. You have to do sufficiently many of them, or enough of them, so that you've checked every formula if you have several formulas in play. Now, that take, that's the difference in terms of the basis step. So basis step is one change. The other thing that changes is the hypothesis step. And I'm not going to lie, the way I wrote this hypothesis step, while 100% accurate, and you'll see it written like this all the time, can make your eyes cross the first time you see it. So here's the official way you write it. You assume that your, your statement works when n equals j for all j that are less than your arbitrarily chosen k that we've had in the past. Now, here's what that actually means. What this means is that in strong induction, and this is really this is really the change between the weak induction and the strong induction, is you go ahead and in your assumption step, you assume that the statement works for n equals k. That's the same as weak induction. Here's the part that changes. You also assume the statement works when n equals k minus 1. You assume n equals work, the statement works when n equals k minus 2, and so forth, all the way down until you get to whatever that smallest integer was. Notice when I first described induction to you guys last time, and I was talking to you about what did I use? I think I used a loop in programming where you initialized it at some point and then you iterated through the loop over and over again and eventually you'd reach all of the integers that we cared about. Strong induction is making the assumption that we are doing that in order. So we did our basis step, then we checked the next n value bigger than the basis step, then we checked the next n value bigger than the basis step, then we checked the next n value bigger, and so forth. And then this here says, hey, we assume we've checked all the situations up until we got to n equals k, and now we're just checking the next one. Logically speaking, this is like what I explained induction to you guys. Weak induction doesn't make the assumption that anybody has checked the cases between the basis step and n equals k in part because we didn't need to worry about using them, but in part because they, we just didn't assume they were checked either. Okay. Now, induction step, the induction step is the same as always. You show that the very next n value works when you plug it into your statement, and you're going to use something from the hypothesis step. Now, when do you need to use strong induction as opposed to just weak induction? When in your induction step, you don't just use the n equals k step, you also use one of these previous guys. So if you need to use two or more statements from your hypothesis, that's when strong induction has to come into play. So let us look at an example. And this example is dealing with 
A sequence. Let me get back to black writing here. So first thing with this sequence is notice it's not given to us by the terms. It's given to us by its recursive formula. Okay? So if we actually write out this sequence, notice what we have. We've got three, and this is when n equals zero. We've got two, this is when n equals one. And if we want when n equals two, this is where we actually have to start using that formula. So a two right here would be three times a one plus four times a zero. Quick check, how did I get those subscripts? Anybody spot how I grabbed the subscripts there? Well, the subscripts, the one and the zero, totally come from the subscripts in the recursive formula. Notice, unlike what our examples were previously, this time we have two of the previous terms in play for our recursive formula. That's fine. You just plug in whatever n you want right here. So in our case, n equals two. This subscript was n minus one, so that's two minus one or one. Here it was n minus two or two minus two or zero. Then plug in the appropriate numbers that we had previously, the two and the three. And if we actually add that together, what is that? This is six. 6 and 12, so this guy would be 18. Uh, now, if we want to do the next couple of terms, I am so not doing all of the next couple of terms, but I'll go ahead and do 3. So if we have look at n equals 3, a3 would be the same as 3 times a2, notice previous term, plus 4 times a1, notice n minus 2, so that's 3 minus 2. So if we plug this in 3 times a2, I am regretting saying I would do this one, plus 4 times a1, a1 was what? a1 was 2. So this is, ugh, that last one's 8. 3 times 18, the 24, uh, 54. So you add it together, and what is that? That looks like 62. So that would be dealing with a sequence. Everybody okay with dealing with a sequence? All right, so when we deal with the induction part, so if we want to show this sequence is true for induction, it's the same procedure almost as with conduction. The basis step here is what? Well, what are we trying to find? We are trying to show that the closed form of this sequence is four to the n plus two times negative one to the n. Everything we know, the way we've told, the way we've been told about the sequence is it's recursive form. So what we're trying to show here is that somebody else who came up with the closed formula for this particular sequence, it actually works for this sequence. Okay? So our basis step will start off with the smallest n value, and in our particular case, our smallest n value is zero. Well, what do we know? When n equals zero, the actual sequence term was given to us, it was three. Well, our formula, the four n plus two times negative one to the n, if you plug in zero, it's four to the zero plus two times negative one raised to the zero, that looks like what? That looks like one plus two or three. So yep, that one works. Now notice, a zero was given to us. That's a formula by itself. A one was also given to us. That's a formula by itself. We don't actually touch the recursive formula until we get up to n equals 2. So if in our basis step, we are going to have to check both n equals 1 as well as n equals 2 to complete our basis step. So here we have that a1 is 2 that was given. If we look at our formula, when we plug in n equals 1 to the formula, we'll have 4 to the first plus 2 times negative 1 to the first. So what is that? That's 4 minus two or two, and yep, that actually matched the term we were supposed to get. Again, we haven't gotten to the recursive formula yet, so this is where we have to actually come down here to n equals three. Now at n equals three, we'll have, I lie, n equals two, the third n value. So n equals two here, we already calculated it up above, we calculated that was 18. So now we just have to use our recursive formula and our recursive formula, not our recursive formula, our closed formula says if we plug in n equals 2, 
we're going to have what? We're going to have 4 squared plus 2 times negative 1 squared. Negative 1 squared is 1, so that second term is 2. We'll have 16 plus 2, and notice that is totally 18. So once we've got to those three n values, our basis step holds or our basis step passes. Now, the next thing we would do is the hypothesis step. But since the hypothesis step is totally uh, tied in with our induction step, and since we are out of time, I'm going to go ahead and we'll finish this example next time. And we'll also have uh, on Monday more examples with these type of sequences to see how they work. We'll actually look to see how you find that closed formula. And then we'll finish up. I think I've only got one, maybe two more examples of the strong, high, the strong form of induction, too. Um, and we'll also talk about any questions that you guys have with the midterm test. But that is it for today. I'll hang out if you guys have any questions, but they, I don't have anything else planned for today. We are done.